<clears throat> Hi everyone, it's Pheromone from RuPaul's Drag Race, but some of you may remember me as uh, one of the most catfished scene boys on the internet, Cameron Ugg. And I'm so excited to be here today with Shoshana, um, of course, the Emo Chronicles. I'm so excited to have you here today. There's so much to talk about. I, it's so crazy to so many people that you were Cameron Ugg and you are who you are today. And it's like, I guess we have to begin and just ask like, when did you sign up for MySpace? <laughs> it is so crazy. It's crazy that there's still people that follow me now that that knew who I was back then. And I always meet I always meet those at the meet and greets where they're like, oh, I've been following you since Cameron Ugg. And I'm always like, I'll blush so hard. Cause it's like it is kind of embarrassing, but it's also kind of iconic at the same time. But um yeah, I, I signed up for MySpace and like probably at the end of 2005, beginning of 2006. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing though until I would say 2007 was like the beginning of the beginning, you know? Oh yeah, so you, but you were early, you were very early. So like, how did you obtain a following with all that? Well, if anyone that obtained a following back then had to be super tech savvy, we, you would, and also be really good at taking selfies, whatever. Um, I started by applying to get on any MySpace train that I could. Um, cause that's, that's really the only way that you could like get friends on MySpace was to, uh, participate in the MySpace trains. Do you want to like explain what a train is for those who weren't actually on MySpace? Oh, yes. For all of you that were not MySpace kids, um, there was a thing on MySpace called a MySpace Bulletin. And it was basically kind of like like a, fa like a Facebook status, I guess. But it was a little bit, probably a little bit more complex because you, you could entirely do like an HTML code on the Bulletin. So um, basically like a MySpace train would be like an HTML code. You would copy and paste it. And it would have like dozens of pictures of like other like, you know, scene kids or whatever. And whichever ones you wanted to add, you could just click their photo and it would go immediately to their friend request button and you could send a friend request. And the thing with MySpace is like um, it was so different than current social media because back then it was it was just MySpace friends. It wasn't like followers. Like you didn't follow people and like most people follow a few hundred people and then they have like a couple thousand followers, whatever. But MySpace, it was just friends. So um, you, you would just both add each other and then your amount of followers would just be how many friends you had. That's where like all of the like W4W came from and like all PC for PC, like picture yes. comment, like, picture comment. <laughs> yes. PC for PC was huge. It, always worked because everybody always wanted picture comments so you post a myspace bulletin be like i just posted a new photo pc for pc people would come um people would also make like individual uh individual bulletin codes that were called a whore code where someone you could like do whore for whore and that meant you would post someone else's code and they would post yours and then it would just get you more exposure that way so we did a lot of whore for whores and we did a lot of PC for PCs. Um, is that funny how shallow that was? It was like, if you comment on my picture, I comment on your picture. <laughs> it was our own way of like beating the algorithm, you know? Yeah. Um, and I feel like people still kind of, there is some, I know that some people on Instagram still kind of do like uh, that kind of thing to try and like manipulate their algorithm or whatever. I haven't ever done that, but I've heard of it happening. So people are still kind of low key doing that. Okay. All right. So the trains are still going on. So, and I understand also you were part of these like super elite perfection groups. Got to tell me all about those. Oh gosh. You know, back in the MySpace days, there, uh, the, the, something that coincided with the trains was, um, Per, they were perfection trains. So there were some trains that they would just let anyone on, but the perfection trains, you had to be like MySpace elite and have like, you know, the perfectly Photoshopped pictures and, you know, like just look seen as fuck. Um, and so uh, a couple of the group, a couple of the trains had um, their own like private group that was kind of comparable to like a Facebook group where it was a private forum 
where everyone could talk about different topics. People could Photoshop each other's photos or whatever. Uh, and yeah, I was, um, <laughs> at some point in 2007 or eight, I got accepted into aesthetic perfection and vanity is perfection and then perfection dolls. Those were like the top three. And if you got in those groups, you had to put the abbreviation in your name. So it was like Cameron Ugg, AP, VIP, PD. I uh, saw those and I never knew what that meant. Yeah, that's why they put them. If you didn't put that in your name, you were immediately banned from the group. Yeah. And if like anyone, if anyone like tried to put those tags in their name that wasn't in the group, they would like, people would find a way to like get your account deleted somehow. I don't know. They could always find some terms of service violation that you did and report you for it. So <laughs> it was like, it was very much like a, a superficial sort of badge of honor to get to put that in your name. Cause it kind of made you, I guess, more elite. I guess, <laughs> but like, that was, that was the whole thing though. Right. Like it was very cutthroat to even be in those groups. Like how many people were in the groups like per group? I want to say, like, at most, I remember, like, 150. That's not um, that many people. It's really not. And they actively did um, threads in the group uh, for deletions topics. So, like, if you weren't active enough or if your photos weren't good or, like, your new photos weren't good or um, if... Uh, you had pissed off enough people in the group for whatever reason, they could like vote you to be like <laughs> deleted from the group. It was very like RuPaul's Drag Race. Like, sorry, my dear, you're up for elimination. <laughs> oh my God, this is, this is how you learned it through MySpace groups. Wow. Okay, so could you get back in if you left? Some people would. Like I, I, I vaguely, it's so hard for me to remember things from this long ago. And I'm so glad that you and I talked like, previously to refresh my memory and I've been sitting and meditating on this all week to try and remember like everything I can from the deep depths of my brain but I feel like I do remember some people that would actively get kicked out and then brought back in and actively kicked out and brought back in because I mean everybody's relationships on MySpace were so volatile all the time like that was just the nature of the game yeah. I mean, it was like, if you weren't a complete and utter bitch, you got eaten alive. Like you had to like, you had to be fierce. Like you had to be fierce in every like, you know, definition of that word. Like you had to be, you had to not only look good, but you had to be really like strong and uh, you had to really defend yourself and you had to be perfect, pun perfect grammar and punctuation. I remember people got deleted because they were spelling things wrong. And it was just like, so looked down upon if you like were illiterate it was just it was so intent um but yeah so that's it's crazy too because from a lot of like the steam emo kids there was a lot of like inner bullying going on but it's crazy because in person at the time to be seen in emo you were bullied like people did not accept that it wasn't like how it is today did you have that experience oh for sure i mean I, I don't know if it was necessarily like my scene-ness that got me bullied as much as it was just my flamboyance and my femininity as like a male. Um, you know, being gay as like a teenager in, you know, the early 2000s and mid to late early 2000s. I don't know. The, what do you call that time period? Like, like from that. 2005 to 2010-ish was the when 2000s. I was like, yeah. yeah, so the 2000s, like it was... It was like, we were not as like free and open to be ourselves back then. Like I, when I was in the eighth grade, a kid stabbed me with a pencil in the hallway. Um, and he ended up getting like uh, suspended and stuff and got admitted into a mental hospital and I had to go to therapy and stuff. But yeah, like shit was crazy. Um, it just was a different world. And like the internet was our escape and uh you know, MySpace was very much that escape. Like you could meet other people like you, even though you were in a town where you felt like you didn't, you couldn't connect with anybody. Ooh, excuse me. <laughs> uh, even if you were like in a small town or a city where you didn't feel like you had anyone that you could, you know, be friends with. So yeah, MySpace was an escape in that way. And those, those MySpace groups actually kind of gave me like a social, I guess, experience in a way like where 
I was able to meet other people like me and stuff. I mean, it's crazy how toxic it was looking back, but like at the time it was so normalized that you don't really, you didn't really think anything crazy about it, but I would never join a online forum that only accepted the most beautiful people on the internet nowadays. That's so cringe. Yeah. It's so superficial, but I guess it was like sort of a defense because it's like in person, you weren't getting that, but these people are treating you like you're like elite, you know, you can have this AP title in your name. So, I mean, I, and then you kind of like felt that eliteness. So it's really interesting, I think. And this was like the first time for people to like, when everybody pretty much had the internet and everybody was like, going on it so yeah it's a very strange period of time and then there was a couple other things that came along with these like grooming for example like i understand that was like prevalent in like all kinds of stuff like site modeling or just myspace in general like was this in some of the elite groups anywhere that there's like teenagers on the internet there's going to be predators and i think we're even seeing this now with like tiktok and instagram like you know, we've seen James Charles talking to underage kids uh, on Snapchat, which is already kind of a sketchy app because everything you post or send gets immediately deleted. So all the receipts are kind of gone, um, which it, I mean, so it, it, it feels weird to say that it was like different back then, but like the more I've thought about it this week, I'm like, actually it's like still going on and this is still a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why we really shouldn't let our kids on the internet. But yeah, like I totally normalized being 14 and talking to 25 year olds in a romantic way and didn't think anything of it. Like, I don't even think I knew that it was illegal at that time, you know, it just felt cool to feel wanted from somebody cool and established. And yeah, like, I definitely think there was a lot of that on my space. Um, There was a lot. There was, and it's it's actually interesting to bring that up because it's like another big thing on the side was like suicide girls. And there were so many people that were probably actually in the elite groups that were also like 14, 15, pretending to be like 18, but clearly weren't just going on groups like that. Like that was kind of like, you know, like that was the look like 14 year olds in literally like, like tiny little like bikinis and stuff. That's how that was a style. I forgot about Suicide Girls. I remember that Suicide Girls was a big topic in the groups because it was like every time a girl in the groups, in one of the groups, like turned 18, they would go and do Suicide Girls. Um, I never, I, don't, I can't remember anyone that I remember on the internet doing Suicide Girls underage. I think they actually were like really strict about that with Suicide Girls. God's Girls, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. because god's girls came after suicide girls um but that was also like a whole other side because since i was you know basically just an emo boy i knew nothing about and i I was also gay so i didn't care to go look at the suicide girls site (laughs) but (laughs) girls was a thing it was like every myspace girl that like kind of like couldn't get modeling jobs would just go do a suicide girl thing oh yeah Uh, It was definitely a thing. And okay, also talking about modeling, you taught me something about Model Mayhem. Like, can you explain that? Like what that whole website was? Model Mayhem was like every like famous scene kids like secret weapon. It was like how you could like pretend that you were a model by finding photographers in your area and doing trade shoots where you would like give them exposure on your platform people still do trade shoots to this day with like Instagram and they're following now where like no one pays any, each other anything. It's just like an exchange of time. Um, but yeah, we used to do a lot of, a lot of model mayhem. I, I did a couple of photo shoots that were a little bit, they were never risque or anything, but like, I remember being like, like 15 or 16 at this one shoot and the like photographer was like, 75 years old and I was so scared I was like texting my mom I was like if things get weird I'm just gonna let you know (laughs) I think that's why I didn't know about it like I think my parents would never let me do anything like that like (laughs) that's crazy though and it's it's funny because I know we also kind of talked about this before as well but it's like you'd think a lot of it was selfies but it turns out like it was like you were actually getting your pictures somewhat professionally taken oh for sure Um, but I mean, I'm not going to lie. It was actually really hard to book stuff through Model Mayhem because I mean, especially being a teenager, like I, there was many times I like didn't want my mom to know what I was doing. And if I couldn't get a friend to take me to a shoot, like 
it just ended up being a lot harder than it was until I got a little older. But um, for the most part, I either had my mom or one of my best friends take all my photos if I wasn't doing a selfie. But at the time, that in that MySpace era, like 2006 you know, to 2008, eight nine self portraits were a thing it's like that's what we called selfies because we would grab like a you know dslr like professional camera and take selfies in front of like a window while the light was coming in so that we looked whitewashed and then our eyes looked super blue that was the trick <laughs> <laughs> that or you take a little flip phone and then you would hold it up like that or actually you could you could usually take a picture on the front as well but they oh, were some yeah. quality images <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, see, the higher quality your images were, the more likely you would get onto more trains and mm -hmm. get uh, into more groups and stuff. So then you could build your following even bigger. A lot of the people that were using like cell phone pics were getting deleted from the groups left and right at some point. They were like, uh, you're just not, you're just not uh, killing it, Gorge. <laughs> Okay, yeah. So it was it was a really cutthroat thing to be in. But I mean, and so then we, something I know we had kind of talked about as well that I definitely think would be important to bring up is so stickham was a side thing, right? So yes. Do you want to explain like what stickham is for anybody who wasn't around back then? <laughs> so for all y'all watching that don't know what stickham was, stickham was a social media site that popped up uh, around the time MySpace started to kind of peak. And it was basically a site where you could do, it was basically Twitch. Like if y'all know what Twitch is, this was Twitch, but it was, it wasn't set up where you could monetize yourself as easily. Like Twitch has like an option where you can like tip whoever you're watching. Whereas Stickam, it was all just about the clout, the clout. So um, yeah, like everyone that was big on MySpace had to have a Stickam account. And also having a Stickam account was, was, it helped people, uh, verify your identity because there were so many catfish around. So, um, Stickam was, uh, you know, every, every, every MySpace kid had Stickam and we would, I had an account on Stickam. I probably had more followers on Stickam than I had on MySpace. Yeah, and that's that's interesting. So, how many followers did you have on MySpace? I had, I think, at my peak, I had like sixty thousand friends on MySpace, but I had accumulated a, about the same amount, and then I got deleted, and then had to start over. So, technically, I like to say I had one hundred and twenty thousand or something like that, but. But that really like, just goes to show that's so different because right now well, on Instagram, you have like 975,000. So that it's just like the amount of people and that was considered really famous. Like that was really MySpace famous. It really was. And, but you know, anyone that has kind of followed the Cameron Ugg journey kind of knows that like my, my like scene fame came after MySpace kind of died when I wasn't using the internet. Like I, there was a point in time for a couple of years when my mom couldn't afford internet at our house. So I went a few years without internet and the, the catfish profiles like pretty much made me famous because at one point, like there was like 2,500 camera nug profiles on Facebook. Um, and it got to the point where like, I couldn't even, once I wanted to return to the internet, once I had internet again, um, I, every account I tried to make on any platform would get deleted for being fake. And it was like, I was having to send my ID to all these sites and it just became such a hassle. I literally felt like I had lost control of my own identity to the point where I was like, kind of like getting messed up psychologically from it. Cause I'd be like, that's my bedroom in the background of that selfie. That's me. Like, that's me. Let me have my fucking account. Yeah, um, that's so annoying. And then it's like you'd, you'd create everything and then all of a sudden it'd just be taken from you. So yeah, back then verified profiles weren't a thing. Mm -hmm. um, there was no uh, account verification. And, you know, nowadays I, I think it's kind of frustrating that you can only get a verified account if you're like famous or a public figure or been on TV. Because, I mean, if we really wanted to like fight the, the epidemic of like the catfish epidemic, like... <laughs> people have actually had their lives completely uprooted, ruined. They've been scammed. Like 
every person should be able to have a verified badge on their profile because people are literally like getting hurt by these like scam scammers. It's really sad. I know if you watch Catfish for two seconds, but the one thing one of my favorite shows. <laughs> I know I, lo I love it. I love it. But like the one thing that just comes to mind right away was there was this one girl that was like Katie Babyface. I don't know if you'd heard of her. She had like the probably blonde hair. okay. Well, so like she pretty much left the internet as well. But what ended up happening was like somebody was using her images, and then like they like like they had this person really convinced, and then they like staged this whole like car accident, and, like killed her off. And so like there was this like wide thing on the internet that like everybody thought that Katie Babyface had died. She didn't die. It was just a fake. It was a catfish. I received so many messages of people over the years like sometimes i still even get a message or two um i don't check as as much and it's, it's, it's so much time has passed but i mean i remember even up until like 2016 i was receiving messages from people that were like um oh my god like i dated you for three years and like they died and i thought i had lost you and then i like someone told me that they like found your real profile and it was so many messages like that I couldn't even count like I even tried to like I, I, I was trying to figure out what I could do to help these people because I figured because there were so many more fake profiles like this probably was happening a lot more than I knew and so I tried to I tried to write Ellen when I was in high school <laughs> just because I, I needed some platform to like be to be like this isn't me like if you're if you guys are talking to someone with these photos, it is not me. I have a MySpace proof video on YouTube. 71077966. I'm real. Bye. Um, but even that didn't really work because once MySpace died, it was like, what do you make a proof video for then? Like, oh, make a proof video for Tumblr? I guess, I don't know. It was weird. Yeah. It was really yeah. hard to get a hold of. And I, my heart goes out to that Katie girl because I know exactly how that feels. It's such a powerless feeling. You just feel like, oh my God, like, could I, is there people that could have died because of a catfish of me? Hope not. That's scary. I mean, that's the internet. That's scary. You don't know who you're talking to. And that's such a strange thing for somebody to steal your identity, pretend to be you. And these people thought they were actually in relationships with you. They thought they had like get people to get them to send money, get mm -hmm. people to send them money, get uh, develop these whole relationships, have a whole cancer episode where they like use like, oh, I have cancer and I'm going to die to like get their pity and then get them to send money and then have that character die. And then these people like, Oh my God. Oh my God. At one point I looked on, um, I looked on YouTube back in high school for like RIP camera nug. And I found like videos that people that dated me made, like, you know, they would do like a slideshow of your photos for people that thought I was dead. No. Oh, that's so, that was the weirdest thing. Like, I feel like if somebody actually died too, they wouldn't really do that. That was kind of like, the like you know that it's a fake when you see that like i've actually had a few followers like send me videos like that and they were like hey can you find this person do you recognize this person and i was like oh yeah it's a famous scene guy Ugh. it's so yeah that's insane and i and the people who fell for it i mean my heart goes out for them like it, it, me it just too. crazy i mean our parents weren't kidding when they said don't believe everything on the internet but now they're believing in q and and conspiracy theories it's like <laughs> Well, you know what? We were like the first because like our parents didn't grow up with access to social media. Like their computers yeah. were not the same as what we had. Like they, they could barely use them. And then we were like that first generation of it's like, well, you know, you kind of just gave us free range to talk to any single person in the world and you don't have to be yourself. So it's like then people would just like they found somebody that they liked and then they just like made themselves that person, which so crazy. But yeah, I mean, that that just like started the culture, which I mean, like definitely brings me to my next question. Like where did you get your like what was your image like you had this like swoop hair kind of like alex evans like where did that come from totally well gosh i um alex evans was probably one of my biggest like scene inspirations um because i wanted to try and like emulate his success so i was like if i can just be like you know if i can just dye my hair but took my it took me forever to convince my mom to let me dye my hair black <laughs> Um, but when she finally did, I went to CVS and got that L'Oreal Furia black box dye. 
I feel like every emo kid knows that box mm-hmm. by. The one with um, the metallic stuff in it. Yep. And I'm not going to lie, shortly after I dyed my hair black and, and figured out how to cut my own hair, because no hairdresser knew how to do that haircut. No one. You had to just take a razor blade and figure it out yourself. Oh, yeah, and very uh, I mean, it wasn't long after I did that that I got into those perfection groups. So I guess it worked. Thanks, Alex Evans, for an aesthetic. <laughs> he just took Alex um, He was just so, or Alex Heartbreaker, as I knew him. He was so big, like, as soon as MySpace hit. He was like a Jeffree Star level, you know? Yeah, seriously. Uh, and so he was probably, I mean, he was, like, monetizing his following, like, in 2006. Oh, five, seriously? Five, maybe. Well, he had, like, a brand, right? Yeah, he had a clothing brand. He had, like, a T-shirt that said, like, haters make me famous. And everyone I know wanted that shirt so bad. Oh, yeah. But some of us didn't have mommy and daddy's credit card to get it for <laughs> us. So I regret it to this day that I don't have that shirt. And it's probably, like, five, $600 on eBay right now. Like, all of the old merch, like, like even Drop Dead merch from back in the day, so expensive. Kiki Cannibal's merch was also my favorite, where she had the diamond the necklaces. Diamonds. Mm-hmm. One of my best friends in um, high school or middle school ordered one and um, wore it all the time and would let me wear it for, like, photos and stuff. It was so cute. But all those things that. can just be easily recreated. I, I should... I mean, I, if I really wanted one of those Alex Evans shirts, I could just get one printed. <laughs> yeah, you could just go on Redbubble and just put it on it. I know, but it's, like, not authentic. Like, it's not the brand. <laughs> I know. I've, I've totally considered doing that with so many brands. But, no, that's crazy. So, did you ever actually, like, know Alex? Like, did you ever meet Alex? I didn't, I didn't know Alex until after I did Drag Race. Um, so many people kept mistaking because because uh fan pages and stuff kept trying to like get like um hype on their posts by like like uh illuminating my scene kid past but in doing so they would like mix like a couple of photos of me and then a couple of photos of alex evans and so obviously all the comments would be like only one of those is cameron the other one's alex evans blah 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 and would tag him and um so he hit me up and he was like, you know, we've been compared like on the internet together for so long, like we should do a photo shoot one day because he's a photographer. Um, but then, you know, shortly after the pandemic hit, this was 2019. So mm-hmm. it's still in the works. One day we'll do it. Um, okay. He's super nice that. though. Uh, it is, it is kind of cool that, I mean, I feel bad because I feel like he's probably so annoyed that so many people tag him as pheromone. You know, that's such a thing. Everybody commented that when I made the TikTok video on that. I had to do an entire video being like, this is Farah and this is Alex. (laughs) Yup. Yeah, I feel bad. That that had to have been annoying, but he's sweet about it, so. Okay. So uh, where did the name Cameron Ugg come from? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Cameron Ugg actually came from frustration because my original MySpace name was Cameron Catastrophe. That was like 2006. Good. Um, Because, you know, you had to do your first name and then some kind of chaotic word that matched the same first letter as your first name. But Catastrophe just kept getting used so much. And I was like, I'm never going to make it if I have the name that everyone else has. So out of frustration and like a temporary moment, I didn't know what to put. So I was just put, ugh. (laughs) And then I never changed it. And it just like stuck. (laughs) So good. Literally the first thing I said to you was like, okay, so like pheromone, is that like a play on words from Cameron Ugg? (laughs) Like you're moaning at the end. Uh, and you know, it's it's actually such a weird coincidence and it's so funny to me and I think about this all the time because coincidentally, like both of the brands I created for myself ended up like having a a sound as like the word that was this last name. Um, but pheromone was actually supposed to be a play on words on like pheromones, like um, the, the aromas that you give off when you're like horny or whatever. Oh, that's sex hormones. good. I didn't even think of that. That's really good. Okay. For sure. Because my uh, one of my first drag mentors, her name was Serotonin. 
So it, we were like serotonin and pheromone. Oh, that's so cute. I love that. <laughs> I love that. That's really oh, good. Really. Cause I was thinking Farrah, what like Farrah Fawcett. That's what like I was thinking. Well, on Drag Race, I had they had asked me where my name came from, and I I just said a stupid joke that I didn't think people would take seriously. I was like, "Well, Farrah, because I love Farrah Fawcett, and Moan because I'm a whore." And people actually thought that that's where my name came from, and I still get tweets like to this day that are like, oh, "I just got that your name was a play on words of pheromones." Oh my, yeah. I mean, I could see it. I mean, when you say it like that, it's like, oh, okay. I've learned I need to be more like mean what I say and say what I mean. And not everyone that's just getting to know me is going to understand my sense of humor. So yeah, that created like a lot of confusion in my um, career. Cause a lot of the fans from drag race, they just like, they were like, what? And then, and then drag race kind of made it my brand and the way that they edited me to be whiny. And like they accentuated every time I moaned about something or groaned like, Every time I complained about something or whined, like they made that like into my brand. So yeah, then people the thought I was pheromone because I was like proud of being a whiner, like a whiny baby. And I'm like, oh, guys, it's because of pheromones. <laughs> Have y'all ever taken a biology class? Oh, <laughs> uh, it's like too good. It just went over ever, but like including my like heads, like, oh my God. Yeah, I know. I just thought it was a play on like your Cameron Ugg name, but I mean... <laughs> But honestly, it kind of feels like fate, doesn't it? Because, like, it, they do coincide in such a crazy way, and it was so unintentional, but then somehow happened. So I'm always like, maybe, you know, I was on to something. Like, maybe all of this was, like, meant to happen how it did, you know? Yeah, because, I mean, it did play, right? You were telling me. So, okay, so going back to Stickham, you said Stickham was the first time you dressed up in drag. Oh, yes. So, guys, I had a catfish account of myself. I, and I only say catfish because I made like a profile where I would dress up like a girl and uh, put like wigs that I got at Party City on. I, I had a black wig. And so like in the right lighting, it looked real because black hair is so easy to pass on, pass off as like real hair. Oh, yeah. It doesn't look as like shiny and fake when it's synthetic as other colors do. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, like I made like a girl profile and I would like go into like boys rooms and see if they thought I was cute. <laughs> Um, and that kind of just like helped me build my confidence up because so like I had always been a cross dresser like my whole life since I was two, since I was old enough to walk. So um, that was like my way of like having like a little secret way to like be a girl. And of course my mom never knew about this, like, but I did go to her bathroom and steal makeup so that I could do this. I sold mascara, powder, concealer, um, I didn't even have a five o'clock shadow to cover then. So that, I think that's uh, all I wore. Okay. Mascara and powder concealer or powder so, foundation. Did people know, like, did people ever figure out it was you? Well, all of my, all of the people in like the MySpace groups knew it was me. They loved it. They like were so nurturing about it. <laughs> they would like, they would like help me like, um, they would like bring me into rooms and see if like, other people that we kind of knew would like get it, but and they all ended up being like kind of in on the joke. Oh, uh, okay. But one time I was on Stickam is my girl form. And I was like wearing like a little crop top and I like bent over to like grab something, but I had the camera positioned like in a total MySpace angle. Like I was sitting on the floor and my laptop was like on a chair and I had the laptop like tilted down. So you could see like a little like, uh, roll when I bent over and I almost got deleted from all the, this one girl was like ready to expose me for being fat. And at the time I was like 110 pounds. Um, so that was really toxic. <laughs> that... Of course no one kicked me out because they were like, girl, you're absolutely crazy. You're just a hater. That's so crazy. That's just like the perfect example of like what it was like to be on my speed. That is crazy though. Wow. Don't even get me started on the girl that got kicked out because they found an unedited photo of her and she was like 50 pounds heavier than she appeared to be in her photos. And they called her a Sif and like bullied her out of the groups and never heard from her again. A Sif? What does that stand for? Secret internet fatty is what it was called. 
Yeah, this is why I love like modern day. It's like you can just be yourself. And also like we all use filters anyways and that's like the norm. Like literally when you're making a TikTok, it just automatically puts a beauty edit mode on. Like you don't even have to like select that. Totally. But it just, it, it's not, like when I think back about that instance with her, it's literally no different than so many people I know. Like, like every influencer that you guys follow has edited the shit, facetuned the shit out of their photos. Yeah. Not every influencer you follow has a perfect body every time, but they don't want you to know that. So they will literally shave off whatever 20, 30, 40 pounds that they gain and then lose whatever. And you never know the difference because you don't see them out and about, but like social media is such a lie. It still is. In mm -hmm. fact, it, it, the editing is probably even more of a problem now because it's really like fucking up our reality. Did, you, did uh, you see that whole thing with Khloe Kardashian? How like that picture went up and then she was like suing anybody who had the picture up because she was like, I don't look like that. And it was just like, a, she looked fine. Like she was very skinny, like it was crazy. And see, that's like what this does to our heads. Like she's obviously been, no one can ever put their foot in her shoes because she's on such a big platform. I mean, imagine if you had hundreds of thousands of people calling you fat every single day, like hundreds of thousands. Like it gets to It has to mess with your fucking head so hard that you will never ever be able to like how you really look, you know? And yeah. I've even let, slipped off into that kind of way. It's so scary. It's so toxic. Um, it's so funny though with, with that being a scandal in my space because it was like to be in these like elite groups you had to be photoshopped well but then like if you were over if you were just a little too photoshopped then it wasn't okay it was just like whatever yeah it's like where's the line like okay yeah it, it just that's so crazy that was that was my space though to a t and that i mean i i'm glad i honestly feel like it's kind of worse now i mean there is like yeah. a body positivity movement going on but I can still tell you that there's some severe fat phobia running through the veins of so many people that are using social media. Oh, it's insane. Yeah, no, I've seen it a lot. There's so many people. If somebody's like 10 pounds overweight, somebody will comment and be like, why don't you work out? And then people have to like post videos of themselves working out and like prove it. And it's like, are you kidding me? Like, why does it even matter? Like, let people be themselves. Let me fucking eat whatever the fuck I want and be juicy and thick. I don't give a fuck, but... God, it, like, I'd be lying. Like, I, there's been so many times I've done shows and then, like, been excited to see, like, the photos that fans have taken and then go and see, like, the captions. Like, she looks like she's really gained a lot of weight. This is, like, not what we got tickets for. I've had promoters, like, tell other girls, like, oh, I thought Farrah was going to be thinner. She's, like, a little fatter than we thought she was going to be. Like, oh, yeah, like... I've been struggling with an eating disorder probably since the MySpace days and it really never gets better. Like I literally struggle with like wanting to eat food ever, but like the pandemic has kind of like allowed me to not give a fuck and just like really evaluate what's important in life. <laughs> Yeah, same. It's so funny because I feel like everybody's gained weight in the pandemic. And it's like, I'm just like, like literally me, like I've just been here. It's like, I can eat, like, I'm just eating whatever. Like, I'm just trying to survive inside. Like they didn't want us to go out and work out. So, you know. <laughs> well, in LA, our gyms didn't open until like three weeks ago. Like they were closed Crazy. all year. <laughs> so everyone in LA is fat now. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> it's so good. Revenge. Oh man. Yeah, no, no, those were the times. And it's it's crazy because so and then the next thing, so you went from MySpace to Tumblr. And then like Tumblr like had that whole like Proanna thing. Like you literally couldn't weigh anything. You couldn't even have legs on Tumblr. Like you couldn't they couldn't touch. That was like the thing. Oh the that was the birth of the thigh gap obsession. Mm -hmm. The thigh gap obsession. We'll see. Um, since I was basically just presenting as an emo boy on Tumblr, I had a much easier, all I had to do, I, I literally almost only posted like Photoshopped selfies on Tumblr um, and just little emo boy selfies and they ate that shit up. I had, I, I probably out of all of the like emo sort of followings, I probably had the most, I, I know I went over a hundred thousand on Tumblr. Wow. Um, I definitely did. But Tumblr was just so different and fun. Like, 
I didn't really follow people for like what they looked like. I, I liked to follow them for what their like inspiration and their aesthetics and the things that they would reblog and like the things that we'd have in common. It was kind of wholesome in that way. Yeah. For me, at least. It, was, it was different. It was like, it was kind of cool. Cause like creating a Tumblr, like you could totally like reblog everything to like your aesthetic, which was somewhat similar to like having a MySpace. You just can't do that anymore. Like on Facebook, like it's so different. You're not like coding it and stuff, but so like, okay. So like in a timeline, right? So like what years did you have MySpace until like 2007? So I left MySpace in 2009 um, okay. and then didn't have internet until like the end of like 2010. And then I got on Tumblr. Okay. Um, and so, to, and then what year were you like 2010 till when on Tumblr? 2010 to 2012. And then 2012, I started doing drag and I, that was all I focused my attention on. And I dropped all of, I dropped all camera and social medias and I went full throttle with pheromone. Well, that was, like, a way probably for you to, like, just regain yourself. Like, you could literally be you on the internet versus, like, your stolen identity. I could have an account. <laughs> yeah, I could have an account. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, because you, yeah. you – I don't even think you said that now. Like, your accounts kept getting deleted because yeah. everybody thought that it wasn't you. I, it was mostly – I was trying so hard to make a Facebook account because everyone in high school had a Facebook. They all moved from MySpace to Facebook, and I, I wanted to have one. Um, but I didn't ever want to have, like, my real name out there because, I don't know, like, some intuition in me was, like, don't let anyone on the internet know your real name because it was so easy back then. I mean, it still is to, like, figure out people's addresses and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I was always just kind of scared of that. So I was trying to make Cameron Ugg Facebooks, and I could not make one. Like, I literally couldn't. I, it was, like, four or five tries of getting deleted. Um, and then I finally... Uh, I finally just made like a, a Facebook with like my real name and only uploaded photos um, that fans wouldn't recognize. Like I had to like take like separate pics for Facebook. Oh, uh, wow. So that they'd be like, he kind of looks like Cameron Ugg, but it couldn't be Cameron Ugg. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. So then it was like, now you're pheromone and now you can like actually be you. That's so yeah. crazy. And I'm verified and I yeah. still have fake pheromone accounts that are trying to like scam people for money. Of course you do. There's always, but at be this point I'm like, that. go for it ladies. Just send me a little cut. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, hey, that, that's the internet, right? So, okay. So like you had, so we went MySpace, Tumblr, and then Obviously, you went to drag, but then, like, in the like, what years was Stick Ham really big? What years did you go on Stick Ham? was, gosh, I want to say like 2007 to 2009. Okay. All right. And then, like, do you remember during that time it was like sticky drama? Were you ever? Oh, on sticky drama? yes. I remember when, um, Kiki Cannibal's boyfriend died and they posted his corpse on there. I remember uh, Kiki Cannibal's getting posted. I remember the exact day that that happened. That was so crazy. I mean, every single one of us that like, they hacked her MySpace and made it her profile picture. And they put it as the as a repeating backdrop on her backdrop. So like everyone that looked at that had child porn on their computer. I mean, I don't even understand how, like, who even did – did they even find out who did that? I don't think they ever did. I don't think they ever did. Yeah, I never heard anything on that. And then, you know, she she kind of went MIA for a little bit after that and, like, came back. I mean, like, good for her for coming back to the internet because I think I would have been done. But uh, it was yeah. crazy. Yeah, all of that. And then, of course, Stickham kind of died when the whole John Hawk thing happened, which was just horrible. Yeah, the John Hawk thing was, like, the shot heard around the world. It was – because we all, like, they had John Hawk, like, he was always on the homepage of Stick'em as, like, the number one streamer. Um, and so everyone knew John Hawk. There was one time he came into my room while he was hanging out with Jeffree Star, and they, like, were in there for, like, 30 minutes and then left. And, I, and everyone in my chat was, like, freaking out. So, like, oh, my God, Jeffree Star and John Hawk just came in your Stick'em. Um, I remember, oh, I, I was friends with Chris Crocker back then. And he had me as a moderator in his stick am room. Um, and my job was to just like block any like transphobic or homophobic people 
because he was living as a woman at the time. Uh-huh. Um, so I, that kept me pretty busy. Uh, but Chris was always so fun to be in a stick and chat with. He's so funny. He just was like, so it's so weird that like, it's so weird how fun that used to be. But like now I like hate streaming live. Like I hate going live on Instagram. Like it's just not the same. Yeah. It, it was different. It was like a weird dynamic. Like, and it's, I would say it's actually very different now. So back in the day, like Stickham, you had websites like Tiny Chat. There was like so many other websites like that. There's like Blog TV. And then you had like Omegle and Chat Roulette, which were just like the randomized things. Like that was very much like we learned that we could have like cameras on our computer and we could like broadcast and talk to people. But now I'd say it's, it's different because when you go on them, it's like, even on TikTok, like you have this expectation of like, I don't know, you have to be like a certain thing on it. Whereas like on Stickham, you could kind of just go on and talk to people. It's hard to explain, but it's very different. So one of the funnest parts of Stickham was how like one, you could like um you could assign moderator. So there was always somebody in the room that had your back that like you so you didn't have to deal with any of the haters, which was nice. I don't think, I think that's something that's kind of missing in the current streaming world. Like if I were to go live on Instagram, there's nobody that I can assign to like block people that are sending hate mail through. You know what I mean? I know you can on TikTok, but I don't think you you can can on Instagram. Yeah, you can on TikTok, which you can also go two people on live now. They've been changing everything up. Oh, I, you know what? If I, if I ever start really starting to use TikTok, like I really hope to at some point, um, that's awesome. But you know, that was like, Stickam was able to do that. And then you could also like have all of your friends also live with you at the same time. Like you could have like 10 people there. Yeah. yeah. You could do private rooms. Like if you were just going to do like, which they might have that on the current streaming platforms. I'm not sure. I don't know. Private rooms, probably not so much, but I mean, Stickham was like a whole different genre though. Cause like it was Shit sort of down not in the private Stickham rooms. Yeah. They weren't, they weren't filtered. It, like if you're on TikTok and you swear, they take it down and then you're banned for like a week. Like you have to be so careful. Yeah. It's crazy. They really, really moderate that. I mean, I always see like my favorite TikTokers like being like my live was banned and I'm like, what? Yeah. Oh yeah. You can't even swear. You can't even like mention like anything. It's crazy. Um, no. So that's, that's, that's scary. Just... <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I, I try to I'm be really, really careful. Drag queen. Like I'm going to say fuck. You got to say frick instead. Frick. <laughs> frick like shizna. It's crazy. Yeah. No, that's what I do. But then it's like, okay. So we're talking like those websites, like, and then there was other websites. Me and you kind of talked about like, Oh yeah, like RuneScape and like Gaia Online and all of those, which were like our first, like, obviously we weren't on Face, but it was like our first kind of like social media. Like that's how you interacted with like random people online. For sure. I was a very avid user of Gaia Online. (laughs) Um, And like, I actually made like gold by making like signs for people, like where I'd like write their name on my hand and then take a little selfie, like, and they would send me like 20,000 gold or something. That's um, so good. I love that. <laughs> I loved Gaia Online. I spent a lot of time on there in between checking my MySpace and stuff. But same with RuneScape, I kind of, I kind of, RuneScape was what I kind of did before MySpace, like 2005 when I was a little bit younger. Mm-hmm. Um, and then once I kind of got obsessed with MySpace, I, RuneScape meant nothing to me. But I still know people that I played with RuneScape back in 2005 like we still are friends on instagram and stuff um and then you know any of y'all watching like do not bully me for playing runescape i loved it i still i mean if i wasn't scared of being so addicted to it i would probably still play it every now and then but i do it's probably so different now i'd probably be playing the classic version now they have the classic version they literally made old scape which was like the 2006 version so it's that's exactly the one the I want. Yes, yes. I highly suggest it. No, hanging that's, out that's... in um, Falador, I think, was the city I liked to hang out in. You hung out in Fally. I love it. Fally? I was a Fally girl. You were a Fally girl. Oh, yes. Girl. <laughs> oh, so my weird. God. Stop. <laughs> I'm going to have an aneurysm. Yeah, so you guys all heard it here. Pheromone played RuneScape. Hell yeah. Love that. That's I so used good. to scam people on there. So I learned, oh yeah, I was horrible. That's how I got all my gold on RuneScape. So I had my username had like a bunch of like O's and then zeros. 
but they looked the same. So people would try to report me, but they would like the O's in my name would be actually zeros and they would never actually be able to report me. So I would like, there was like a way, like if you were trading with someone, you could like pull whatever you were giving them back at the last minute before they accepted. Yes. And I'm sure it happened to everyone, but that was me. I was that evil bitch. And I probably have karma still coming to me for that. <laughs> it was, it was a video game. Did you ever have anybody like buying GF? Did you ever see that? Buy- like oh yeah. That's why I had a girl character. <laughs> I stole my Santa hat once. People would just give it to you. They'd be like, will you be my GF? And it I'd be like, can anything. I wear your Santa hat? And then he was like, yeah. And he traded it over. Then I logged out forever. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Yeah, it was really easy. It's so crazy. I feel like that created like this whole culture where you could just like, yeah, everybody would do the scams. I did it. I'm not even going to cap. Like, It's so bad. Oh my God. But no, so I guess on the other thing, like we had kind of talked about as well. So like, Obviously, we're talking about all, like, internet stuff, but, like, when you were really famous on the internet or even, like, kind of before that, like, how did people in real life treat you? Well, I remember my first day of ninth grade, a bunch of girls came up to me when I was sitting at lunch alone and asked if they could take a picture with me. (laughs) Oh, that's crazy. Um, A bunch of, like, emo girls. So, apparently, like, everyone at the high school I was getting ready to go to knew that I was, like, kind of getting big on MySpace in the eighth grade. And so they were like all waiting for me to get to school, like to high school. And so a lot of them knew me already. And so it made it kind of easy for me to make like friends, I guess, as soon as I got to high school. But like, I I wouldn't say that I'm still friends with any of those people. They all ended up to be kind of, I don't know. It was weird. It's like I had people that knew who I was that I didn't, I didn't have the opportunity to get to know them first, but like, that's the weird part about being a public figure. Like even dating now, like as someone that's been on drag race and stuff, it's like people can know everything about you before you even go on the first date with them and you know nothing about them. And so that's always kind of been a constant theme since like the MySpace days or whatever. But I mean, it didn't take long for people in high school to like lose that allure about me when they realized I was just, you know, whatever normal kid there. Yeah, no, that is crazy. I, I can't even imagine. I didn't go to school with anybody who was seen famous. But it did lead to a lot of friendships I had because I guess, I guess I just didn't think the kids in high school I could relate to because I just felt like I was so much more advanced for some mm-hmm. reason because I, like, I knew how to Photoshop my own photos. I knew how to do graphic design. Like, I was just so much more like uh, savvy, internet savvy, whatever. So I ended up becoming friends with all these kids that were like older. And that's when I really experienced problems because God, like there was no reason I should be like doing drugs at 15 with a bunch of people that are like, you know, 21. Yeah. Wow. No, that does not sound good at all. Oh, man. I wish I would have just let myself be a kid sometimes, you know? I really well, just wanted to be an adult so bad. I mean, we all kind of wanted to, but, like, you were, like, super elite, you know? Right. <laughs> so it was, like, no, but that that is, yeah. I mean, that's definitely the thing that comes with it is, like, people are going to treat you different in person, and then that's going to be, like, a different reaction. And, like, it definitely there was this sense of entitlement, I would say, also, if you kind of had, like, a little bit of a following on the internet or something like that, because it's like, oh, you guys don't have what I have. And then at such a young age, that really was Totally. The ego was there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, that's, that's so crazy. So, and then like, I guess we should, I should have asked this probably at the beginning, but like, what well, what do you consider, like, what is seen? Like, what is seen to you? I don't know. Like I would almost, I feel like when it comes to scene, I would have like a similar definition to drag in, in my mind. Like, like I see drag as like anyone who's like unapologetically themselves and not afraid to like pack on a whole bunch of makeup and a whole bunch of accessories and hair pieces and go on stage and, you know, do that. And I feel like scene was very, very, very like similar to that in the sense, like, I think anyone that was, you know, not afraid to be themselves, not afraid to express themselves how they wanted to express, even if it wasn't the like, you know, social norm and, you know, liking the kinds of like music that not everybody at school liked, uh, that was a little bit more darker and deeper you know, maybe had like a little bit intense of a childhood that just kind of formed them. You know what I mean? I feel like to be a scene kid, it was all about, you know, your style, your music taste. Um, But I hate gatekeeping 
uh, I hate gatekeeping like labels. Yeah. So if anyone's watching, if y'all are like kids that are like still in high school and you're like, and you're saying you're seeing, just go with it. You know, you don't need to have a striped raccoon tail extension to be a scene kid. You really don't. <laughs> oh no. And it's actually making a little bit of a resurgence thanks to TikTok. It's crazy. It is. I feel like such an old lady, but I'm like kind of wanting to get into it and show the kids how it's done. <laughs> Do it. No, seriously. I know you were like a scene king before and now you're like a scene queen. Like I love it. Like every spectrum. I'm so good. <laughs> I really wanted to look like the female version of my MySpace persona today. So yeah, I hope I embodied like, you know, Cameron Ugg and drag. Oh, you did it. You did it. It's so good. I, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I don't think I've ever worn a black wig maybe once or twice in my life. So here we are. Really? So going back to your roots, instead of using the L'Oreal, like Feria or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So the cool. Feria, um, Feria, whatever. You know I that dive, even... don't you? No, I do. I don't know how to pronounce it. That's so funny. That's one of those words. We were also having the conversation earlier, like how do you say Chiodos, Chiodos, Chiodos? I don't know. <laughs> she said Chiodos. And I was like, huh? <laughs> Is it Chiodos? Guys, please don't put this in my head these days because I'm like, don't let me think that I've been saying the, the word wrong for all these years. Because I love Chiodos. They're one of my favorite, like, you know, throwback, uh, like, MySpace bands. Um, I saw them live in 2007, changed my life at the Taste of Chaos tour. Okay, I'm really jealous of that. <laughs> that's not fair. I wish I was there. So, okay, that's that's also the amazing thing, too, is you have really, really good taste in music. Which Thank you. I, I was actually kind of shocked when you were like, oh, I listen to all of these screamo bands and all of... Like, you, do you still actively listen to that kind of music? Oh, yeah. And, you know, I have to, like... Like, when I'm on a tour with other Drag Race girls and I'm wanting to listen to my music and I'm having to get ready with other girls, like, I can never play it because they cannot handle it. Like, oh, no. So most of, I mean, most of the music I listen to now, it's, like, either Christina Aguilera or Screamo music. Um, and my fans that have found my Spotify profile can vouch for me. Oh, I can follow you on Spotify. Because <laughs> <laughs> it shows them what, like, if you follow someone on Spotify, it shows your followers what you're listening what to. What you're listening to, yeah. Oh, when, that's so good. When I went to go film All Stars 4, um, I forgot about Spotify, and I almost gave, like, after I got eliminated and came home, like, they don't want you to, like, they don't want any way for a fan to know that you're at home, so they, like, don't want you to use your phone or anything. And I, like, realized, oh, fuck, like, I've been listening to music. Like, they're going to see that I've been active on Spotify and know that I was eliminated early. So I had to, like, I went and changed all my settings on my Spotify after that. But, um, yeah, I used to have, I have these, I have uh, these two fans that are twins and they live in the UK. Um, and they would always, like, tweet me whenever I was listening to, like, a whole, like, string of super, super emo songs. And they'd be like, are you okay, sis? Like, <laughs> you've been, like, hitting hard on the emo playlist. That's so good. What are your top five favorite, like, scene emo bands? Like, off the top of your head. I oh, gosh. Uh, the Used, Chiodos, Seosin, um, uh, Scary Kids, Scaring Kids, uh... Uh, from first to last, since his fail. Um, That's six. Uh, Dance Gavin Dance. Oh, I it, love that. Johnny Craig's bands. I've love. I love all of them. Slaves. Um, uh, what is the other one he has? Um, Emma Rosa. Yes, Emma Rosa. Uh, let's see. I just pulled up the Taste of Chaos rundown from 2007. It was the used 30 Seconds to Mars, Census Fail, Seosin, uh, Aiden, Chiodos, and Evelyn. Oh, that sounds so good. And that's like I in the I still even fuck everything. with some from first to last, but you know, before uh, he went on to do Skrillex. Oh, yes, anymore. 
Sonny Moore, yeah. So good. I even loved, like, the newer, like, with Matt Good. I really, really loved oh, the Oh, me first too. One. I forgot about that. I need to go add that to my, like, playlist on Spotify because I totally forgot that they did that. Get on it. Oh, yeah. Actually, it's kind of funny because I have, I created, like, one time on a live stream with a bunch of my fans. Like, we made an emo playlist and we made, like, a scene playlist. And they brought back so much old music to me. It's, like, I love that. I love talking about music because it's just, like, I'm still stuck in those days but no okay so like going back to social media like off of that like so <laughs> the social media kind of also kind of created these things so like obviously like first it was emo which I think was kind of like an offshoot I think it went like punk and then like skater boy punk is what I mean by that and then yeah. it went to like this like weird thing of like goth and then it went to emo and then it went to scene and then after scene, it became hipster. And I know yes. you were hipster for a short period of time. All of the scene kids turned into hipster kids when the birth of like Tumblr happened. Like I remember the exact moment that like all of my scene guy friends were shaving their head, growing beards and like wearing uh, plaid scarves and uh, oversized glasses that had no prescription in them. <laughs> Yep, those were the days. And that was such a short period of time. It was like the men kind of became like nerdy lumberjacks. Totally. <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm, that was probably so loud. But like, that's the best way to describe it. It's so weird. And that was the, and then, that was and the ones that became nerdy lumberjacks ended up becoming like those guys that are like older, that have like a full beard and like are tatted and bald and... Yep. Like, still have, like, pretty girlfriends somehow, but are, like, drink, like, a million beers a day. I know. Like, oh, my God. Speaking of who the perfect example of this is Danny from Asking Alexandria. Oh if you gosh. look at his, like, aesthetic, like, timeline, he's, like, the embodiment of what happened. A hundred percent. He was kind of, like, the blueprint. But, yeah, a hundred percent. Oh, man. I knew him. I used to be friends with him uh, back in the day. I did a lot of him. I'm not going to lie. I hope this doesn't get us demonetized, but. <sighs> Ooh, yeah, he, that's he, so he crazy. crazy. He had a fake ID when he was like 18 and you never would have guessed he was 18. He was able to do like he was buying the liquor and everything whenever he would come to Houston. Oh, Wow. Okay. And you know, what's crazy. Cause that's something I'm kind of learning is like, everybody was so connected. Like all of like the famous scene kids and scene bands, like they all knew each other. That's cause we were all in those groups. Yeah. To a T. Yeah. That's, that is so crazy. So yeah, I mean, wow. It's just wild. And I feel like we could probably go and we've, we've definitely talked a lot about everything, but we could probably go on about all of this forever. We could do a whole part two and I could wear the other way. Oh, you know what? I think we have to. <laughs> Maybe we'll let this one sit and boil and bake for a little bit, see what everyone thinks, and we could come back and do a part two. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. Definitely on my mind that's happening, and we definitely need you in that second wig. So, mm hmm This was great. No, thank you so much for that. Is there anything else that you think we should add? Um... Listen, if any scene kids are watching this that are like in high school now that are like kind of idolizing this time period, just know it was so much darker than you would have thought. And also do not talk to men that are in their 20s if you're a teenager, it's not worth it. You're not cool because they're talking to you, they're talking to you because you're easy to prey on. Um, be yourself, have fun, be sweet, be a good person. Don't, be, don't make it like how it was for us where you had to be a bitch to be cool. Be, it's so much cooler to be nice. Um, and yeah, have fun. Make it. I feel like scene is so drag in a way. Like there's so like there's so many aspects of it that are so side by side. Like it was so much about like expression and gender fluidity. And um, I think that was one of the funnest things about being a scene kid was that there was just there really was like a no a judgmental no judgment zone on the internet. <laughs> Like, it's weird that I wasn't judged for, you know, cross-dressing uh, back then but I, by the other fellow group members. But if you were a little bit fat, you were. So take that for what it is. Um, love yourselves, you guys. You know, don't, uh, don't compare yourself to other people ever. Just believe in yourself. Love yourself. Be yourself. Amazing. Thank you so much.